Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to our Emmy Contender series. My name is Yvonne Villarreal and I cover television. We're here today with Queer Eye's Bobby Burke, who we're, I'm hoping maybe, will leave with some design tips for our space. Do you yes. have any already? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do something. <laughs> And not necessarily what this would you space. Add? I like the chairs. Or yeah. the chairs. It's more the the lobby walking in. Oh, and what would you do? Uh, something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're just starting. I know, out. I know, I know. I know. If I didn't know you had moved into this building recently, although looking around, I thought it was a little more recent than it was. Um, but still, I mean, you've got great bones. You don't like the minimalist style? Um, it's more like the plywood, like security desk. I okay. Love. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, there you go. Are, are people nervous when you come to their house? It's funny. Um, friends now, they're like, oh, God, we're scared for you to come over. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, I'm so not that person. I'm yeah. like, you know, design is my job, but and it is kind of my life, but I don't, I don't walk into your home and judge stuff. Okay. You know, whatever makes you comfortable. I mean, I will walk into your home and it's filthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but design-wise, to me, design is so personal. So if your home makes you happy the way it is, I don't care if it's not my personal taste. Mm -hmm. It's your taste. Mm -hmm. So live your best life. How has it been like when you visited the other guys' homes? <laughs> so uh, right after filming season one and two, Cromo and Anthony, or Cromo and Jonathan, uh -huh. I think Jonathan even had it done before we left, um, had their houses redone. Oh, really? Because after seeing not how easy it is, mm -hmm. but how seeing how your home being designed well can really affect your life and affect your happiness and affect your mental health. They're like, God, we need to fix our place up too. So Cromo did a lot of the work himself, though he says, <laughs> I didn't personally witness it, so okay. we'll, the jury's still out. Okay. Jonathan called his ex-boyfriend, who is also a designer that's still good friends with him, and he's like, you gotta have my house all pretty by the time I get home. Oh, wow. Um, Anthony's place, Beautiful. Anthony has impeccable taste. Tan has impeccable taste. Mm -hmm. So their homes, no, I wouldn't do a thing to them. When did you realize this was something that you had a passion for? Oh my God, I was probably like four, I'd say, when I redid my bedroom on my own for the first time. I found this dinosaur poster that I loved that had like this yellow and blue and green in it. And so uh -huh. I did the whole room based off of the colors of that poster. Uh huh. So yeah, so I always, I always loved it. I just, you know, growing up in Little Missouri, didn't realize that it was something that I'd eventually end up doing. Mm -hmm. Well, so talk about, um, well, before we get into how transformative changing your space could be, let's talk about how you found yourself on Queer Eye and the way you guys sort of glommed to each other from the start, it seemed, during the auditioning process. Um, have you seen the movie Hangover? <laughs> yes. That's kind of how it started. That's like, I went out for a crazy weekend and I woke up Monday on Queer Eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my journey to Queer Eye, it's funny because if you go back to 2003, mm -hmm. when the original Queer Eye yeah. was out, you know, imagine me working at Restoration Hardware, um, getting the store all ready the night before for Tom uh -huh. Felicia to come in and film for the original Queer Eye. Wow. Um, and then the next morning getting fired while Tom was upstairs filming Queer Eye. <laughs> Is this true? Totally true. I mean, long story, Whoa. but totally true. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, Queer Eye has been touching my life for a long time. Wow. Uh, but getting on the show, my publicist had heard they were recasting and she knew, I mean, it was an iconic show for me mm -hmm. and that I would definitely want to be a part of it if I could. So mm -hmm. she got me on a, a Skype audition, which I thought went awful. Really? Um, I had, you know, everything set up in my apartment behind the camera, like looking all beautiful. And then like 10, 15 minutes before the power went out in my building. <laughs> Historic downtown okay. buildings, gotta love them. Right. Um, so I'm like, crap. So I jumped in my car, drove to my office as fast as I could, uh -huh. get in there, you know, I'm all hot and sweaty and disheveled, and the wall behind me is black, which made me look super pale. So I probably, I look super pale right now, <laughs> right, right now. Back yeah. here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and I just, I thought it went horrible, but it didn't. They um, called me back for an in person interview, and then, yeah, it's, it's funny. So, we all talk about auditions and how it went, and Karamo has always been adamant that the final in-person auditions had about 100 guys. Because it started out at about 5,000 applicants, wow. and they whittled it down to 40. But Karamo always thought, no, it's 100, it's 100. So finally the other night, we were with the creator of the show doing a panel, yeah. and I asked, wait a minute, David, how many were there? And he's like, 40. 
far cry from 100. Uh -huh. So they narrowed it down from thousands down to the top 40. Okay. And yeah, we went from there. So, I mean, we hear you guys talk about how you had this sort of instant connection or you really gravitated toward yeah. each other. Um, but what, like, what were your really real feelings about these guys? Because Tan like shared the story, like he kept it honest about how he wasn't sure about Jonathan at first. I think none of us were. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like, um, Cromo and Tan and I were the ones that clicked first. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if we just ended up sitting next to each other and started chatting. I think I remember purposely going over and sitting next to Tan mm -hmm. because, like, his hair, yeah. he's just so handsome. Did he have the French tuck then? Was he rocking it? He had on a camel jacket. I forget okay. what shirt he had on. Okay. Um, but just, like, this beautiful camel jacket and that quaffed, silver, gorgeous hair. Uh -huh. And I was like, I have to know this one. And so I sat next to him, and then Karamo sat down next to us, and he was cold. So he took Tan's jacket to cover up, and then we just kind of clicked. And as we were coming in and out of auditioning, we just would end up mm -hmm. back next to each other. And then Antony kind of came into the fold, and then Jonathan would just twirl by and <laughs> twirl by. Uh -huh. And we were like, whew, that one's got energy. some energy. Yeah. And I, honestly, I think all of us at the beginning were like, all right, this one's putting on a show. Mm -hmm. There's no way this is real. Mm -hmm. But by day two, it hadn't wavered at all. Like his energy level didn't change. And I was like, actually, maybe, maybe he's not just putting on a show, you know, because sometimes when people have a lot of energy and they're yeah. over the top, you're like, oh, it's Hollywood. Right, this right, is right. just a character they're playing. But then I got to know him a little bit more in auditions, and I'm like, actually, I don't, I don't think this is a character he's playing. I'm like, he's just a character. Uh -huh. um, and then after we got cast, like realizing that this is just him and his wonderful, loving bubbly mm -hmm. energy is just his personality it's and once you re yeah once yeah. you realize it's real you're like oh this is great yeah. but yeah i think you know with tan what he was saying was in the beginning especially tan tan is very british yeah, yeah, yeah. he's very proper uh -huh. tan loves a boundary after boundary after boundary and jonathan doesn't hold anything back like mm -hmm. some of the stories he was telling us auditions you know we're all clutching our pearls <laughs> um, but yeah he's just very open and free and once we all realized that this was him and this is truly genuinely him, we loved him for it. So once you get cast and it's your first day of filming, what do you remember about that experience? And like, was it hard to settle into like, okay, this is what we're doing? So How I had never been a TV host before. And you know, a lot of times people don't think of us as host because mm -hmm. they just think of us as a show. Yeah. But we, we actually are hosts. We're just five hosts working together to help somebody. So I had never done it before. You know, Karamo had. Yeah. So Karamo had more experience behind the camera. You know, Jonathan had. Um, but Tan and Anthony and I, you know, I had been on a few design shows, but nothing like this. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning it was scary, but honestly, five minutes into it, we weren't even really thinking about it. We just, we had gotten so close already that we, we knew each other really well. Because if you think about the fact that, you know, how much time do you spend your whole life with your best friend? Mm -hmm. Even if you grew up with your best friend. Mm -hmm. Not nearly as much as we've spent with each other in the last few years. Right. So we really, truly have gotten to know each other so, so well. A lot of people don't always believe, they're like, there's no way you guys are that close and know each other that well. I'm like, if you spend this much time with anybody, you know, Everything about them, especially when you have people like Jonathan who shares everything, mm -hmm. you know. So all the good, all the bad, all the pretty, all the ugly. So what are the quirks? I mean, we know that Anthony has a thing for smelling things. Um, what are some of the other quirks that you've come to realize? Uh, some of the other quirks. Hmm. No, I don't even think of them as quirks. Do they anymore. do things that annoy you? God, yeah. <laughs> we're we're literally, like yeah, yeah, we're like five friends. brothers. Yeah. You know, I always, there's always that line, like, I can talk about my mama, but you can't yeah, talk yeah. about my mama. Uh -huh. Like, I that's how we feel that. about each other. Like, I can talk crap about my brothers because we're brothers, but mm -hmm. if you, I'll kick your butt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, like, of course there's things that we do to each other that annoy the hell out of each other, and mm -hmm. sometimes we do it on purpose. <laughs> so uh, what, what have you, f I mean, talk about what is so transformative about looking at your space and making it something that really brings you joy. Because when I come home and I'm like, oh, there's the mess, and I should clean it up, but I'm so tired, and sometimes I don't. But then when I do, it's, a, it's such a relief. Even so, rearranging stuff. Let's take your bedroom, for example. Mm -hmm. When you go to go to sleep at night, and your bed's still unmade, and there's clothes all over the floor, when you're going to sleep, you're reminded of, I failed. Yeah. 
I didn't get done everything I wanted to get done. I didn't make it through the day the way I wanted to make it through the day, and that's how you go to sleep. Mm. And then the next morning you wake up, and you look around, and you're like, you already feel defeated, mm -hmm. and that's how you start out your day. So if you just take five minutes a day, to make sure at least you're keeping your bedroom tidy, mm -hmm. so you can end your day and you can start your day in a good mind space, it is amazing the effect that it can have on your ability to want to get out of bed, mm -hmm. you know, depression, um, drive, you know, if you're waking up happy, that's how you start your day. You need a good foundation in your day, and your bedroom is that foundation. What have you? What has been some of the feedback you've gotten some from some of the heroes, like about what that meant, what they didn't realize it would do to them? Um, a lot of them, the way they didn't realize it would affect how they interacted with their family mm. and how much closer they've gotten to their family because their home wasn't set up to be conducive to getting to know their family and mm. spending time with their family. You know, like for example, if you go back to season one, Corey, the cop. Um, you know, he hung out in his basement a lot because upstairs his wife had done, he didn't really feel like there was a piece of him there. Mm -hmm. And so to make their, the main love of their home a space where he felt like design decisions were made based on him, his daughters, and his wife, not just his wife. Um, and again, that's not her fault because he yeah. didn't help. Yeah. Um, so it, it really transformed the way they spent time together as a family. Um, their kitchen being more functional, he started cooking more and spending more time with his girls in the morning making breakfast and his wife in the evening. So the fact, the, the way that it's affected how they interact with their loved ones is what I hear the most. Well, and you guys are there and really bringing some change to these people's lives, but talk about the ways it's sort of been brought back to you. Like, We've, in season two, I think it was, you had a real hard time with, I think it was Tammy, yeah. going to the church and stuff like that. So talk about how the show has pushed you too. You know, it's funny, when I got cast, I told Netflix and ITV, I was like, I'll do anything. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, not everything. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I'll do anything. Just the one thing I ask you not to put me through is do not make me go into a church. Mm. Do not make me work with the church. That is the one line I don't want to have to cross. Um, you know, I have a lot of history with the church. The church was my entire life. Mm -hmm. And then when I came out, all of a sudden, it was not. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, uh, and t t uh, the Tammy episode, because a lot of times we'll shoot the episodes and they don't end up showing in the order that we right, shot right, them. Right. So Tammy was actually our final episode of season two. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and she, she wasn't even supposed to be an episode. Um, our original person who had been cast ended up having a, a, a medical emergency okay. about a week and a half, two weeks before we were starting to film his episode. Wow. And so our producers had to frantically try to find Okay. another hero to replace him. And I mean, I'm so glad that it was Tammy, but in the beginning I was not glad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I was very stressed out about it. I didn't want to do it because it was forcing me to deal with a lot of my own demons and mm -hmm. a lot of my own hurt and pain. And I'm like, to me as a host, I'm not here to deal with my pain. I'm here to help our heroes. Help you, not me. Yeah. yeah, but that's the great thing about our show is a lot of times we heal in the process as well. You know, with Corey, it was a lot of healing moments for, mm -hmm. for Gramo and Corey to speak to each other. Um, and for me and Tammy, it, it helped me a lot. You know, am I back in a church? No, no yeah. it's not for me, but mm -hmm. I definitely don't hold as much resentment as I used to because I see that there are loving, amazing people out there like her. Have there been other, I don't want to say, like that wasn't a close call, though I, I'm not sure like if you were like, I'm not going to do this episode, but have there been close calls on the design front, like where you didn't think you were gonna finish or something fell apart. Every week? Yeah, every week. <laughs> um, let's see, Mayor Ted Terry, remember him? So remember how there was that closet in the dining room yes. and I moved it to the master? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well there were termites. <laughs> Everywhere. When we started ripping that closet apart, we found out he had a horrible termite infestion. Oh my God. Uh, infestion. Oh, you can tell I'm tired when my when my, my, <laughs> when my Missouri falls out. Hi. <laughs> um, so we had to like take out as much of the like eaten wood as possible and shore it up structurally. And then I remember um, on our reveal when we were saying goodbye and talking about things, Jonathan was excited and he kept jumping up and down. And I kept like squeezing like, his hand, like not. stop. And finally he slapped at me. He's like, girl, stop trying to rain on my parade or stifle my shine or something. And I was like, this house is infested with termites. And if you keep jumping, we're all going to end up in the basement. Oh my and he was God. like, noted. <laughs> 
Um, and then in season three, um, Joey, our camp counselor. Yes. Uh, we had a big storm the first day we got in there uh -huh. and the tree took out the power. So we were painting and cleaning with like iPhone flashlights. Wow. Um, oh, also Ted Terry, on top of the, the termites, termites, all the furniture that I had ordered didn't show up. So we all had to get four moving trucks and just frantically go all around the city and try to talk stores into letting us pull stuff off their floor. Wow. Luckily, West Elm had two locations in Atlanta and let us okay. completely clear them out. Yeah. Wow. So there's always... Because you only have, you have happening. four days, right? Um, I On get the average? house Tuesday afternoon, and so I have Tuesday afternoon, all of Wednesday and Thursday, and then Friday morning to accessorize and then we start shooting Friday afternoon. How big is the team that's helping you? Depends on the size of the house. Like I have my design team, mm -hmm. which is about six to eight. And then we also have a construction company that we work with that they come in and tear everything out and do all painting, you know, construction stuff, building. Uh -huh. So yeah, it depends on the house anywhere from four to 12 people. And I assume you get like images beforehand so you know what you're working yes. with? Yeah, okay. I have to have measurements. Yeah. You know, there's no way to get flooring there like right. that. There's no right. way. Uh, window treatments, things that have well, to be. Well, because me, the viewer, I'm like, he can do this in four days. I should be able to, but I can't. Well, I also, and there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into before we even start filming, before I ever see spaces. So I usually go out a week or two before the other boys, mm -hmm. and I get a warehouse, and I start filling that warehouse full of things that I love. I um, ordering tons of different art and accessories and bedding and pillows and furniture. And I basically create my own store. Mm -hmm. And then when I meet the heroes, I find out things about them. I find out their personal aesthetic or their mm -hmm. lack of, mm -hmm. and I then get a big box truck and I have shelves on the side and I go to my store and I start pulling things that I think will work for them. And I put that in the truck and I park the truck in front of the house and I have my little mobile store. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I can do it so quickly is I, we've done a lot of pre-planning and I have amazing teams like my, um, my art director, him and his whole team were on Extreme Home Makeover before. Okay. So they built a whole house in a week. So they're really good at knowing how to organize it to make sure that I look good well, and what's on schedule. What's the challenge for you in that you're, you know, you're so, so consumed with changing the space and the other guys tend to have a lot more time with the heroes. Talk about like the way you try to get in your time to get to know them. What, what are their likes and dislikes for a space and stuff like that? So season one and two, I'm sure you notice I'm not in yeah. it that much. Yeah. Um, because producers would be like, oh, do you want to go shopping with Tan? Or this, I was like, I'm <laughs> house. I have time to go shopping with Tan. What are you talking yeah, about? That makes no sense. And then the show came out and I was like, uh, uh, I'm mm -hmm. not in the show. So season three, um, still probably not in the show as much as everyone else, just a because, lot, you know, more. Jonathan, it's literally physically yeah. working with the hero. Tan is, as well, all four of them, it's physically working mm -hmm. with our hero, where me, my project is detached from them. So we had to get creative and figure out ways, to, you know, whether it's a shopping trip, which mm -hmm. in one and two, I didn't really just want to like go to a store with them. Right. I didn't feel that was genuine and mm -hmm. would help affect change with them. Um, but in some episodes, it, it did because it helped them to kind of learn what they like and mm -hmm. what they don't like. But it was more about like finding those little projects where I could build something with them or, mm -hmm. you know, with Thomas, like take him to that little mixer with other kids that loved anime mm -hmm. where he saw that there were other people out there with interests right, like him. Right, right. You know, so it's, it's definitely fun as a host to be able to have a say in what you're going to do or not do. Yeah. Well, let's talk about season three and like what, what would you say was the most challenging space? I, would, I thought maybe the barbecue joint, but I don't know. No. Maybe that was probably fine. It was fine. I mean, because it was so small. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was painting the exterior. It was getting a new sign. And I also, I designed the logo with my team mm -hmm. and all the marketing materials. And so that was more of like a branding job, which mm -hmm. I loved because I don't get to do that that often. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we put some planners and some right. picnic tables. So design-wise, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I would say maybe the most, hmm, maybe Jody episode one, mm -hmm. because... I had only planned on doing her master bedroom and bathroom. And then producers literally that week were like, but how sad is that when she comes into her house for the first time and the living room isn't done? And you know, cause like we've never not done a living room for the moment they walk through the door, they're surprised. We don't want to have to lead her through, you know, her taxidermy zoo to go to the bedroom. So last minute we had wow. to do the dining room and the living room and game room. 
So that was the one that was probably like most down to the wire and my uh, team and I stressful. were. And, and it was location-wise the farthest. Mm -hmm. She was in Amazonia, Missouri, which was about almost two hours away from Kansas City. Well, and I don't want you to pick a favorite because I know that may be hard, but was there a story this season that really struck you or you really connected with? I would say probably Jess. Mm. You know, Jess and I have a very similar story. Mm -hmm. We both adopted. We both had siblings that we thought were cousins. We both left home at 15 because we came out. Um, we both, you know, never really had that sense of home and acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably who I connected with the most. And talk about how you guys stay in touch with the heroes because, I mean, I follow some of them on social media and like the way that they just seem still so touched by what you guys did and like are always posting about what they remember from the experience. So talk about like how you've fostered those relationships. Um, a lot of them I still text with, like Neil from season, is it one or two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from season one. Um, he'll be out next week and he's crashing at my house. Um, he's nice. continued to like remodel other rooms in his place and so wow. I like help him pick out stuff. Um, Jess I text with all the time. Did Neil um, put away Skyler. the Christmas stuff this yes, year? Yes, the okay. Christmas stuff has not come back. Okay, good. Good job, Neil. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, whether it be via DMs or texting, we still try to keep up with as many, as many that want to continue to have relationships with us, we do. What, yeah. is, what has been surprising about the way people have responded to this reboot? Because I know when it was announced, there were a lot of complicated feelings about what this was going to be. Yeah. Um, so talk about what you remember about that and sort of how you guys have been received. So we were kind of worried that people were really, there were a especially, lot of essays. especially the LGBTQ community. Yeah. yeah. You know, everyone's like, why do we need this? It's 2018. This is just so stereotypical. Mm -hmm. What I say to that is, A, get off your coastal high horse. Mm -hmm. Um, there are plenty of places in middle America that not only need ours, but needed the original. Yeah. Um, we're also now in 190 countries where the original was only in America. And, you know, it was syndicated in other countries with different Fat Fives. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're now in countries that had never seen the original, that are still far, far behind us with equal rights. So that was kind of my reaction to that was, God, I hope they like it. Mm -hmm. um, but B, even if you don't, because you think we don't need it, you're wrong. There are people still out there that do. Right. You know, there are still little bobbies growing up in Missouri that need it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the reaction after it came out, you know, because we wanted to, we wanted to pay homage to the original, mm -hmm. but we also wanted to make it different, and we wanted to make it our own. And where that format worked in 2003. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we knew it wouldn't now. We knew going in and ripping a straight guy apart and, you know, because we're gay and we know yeah. so much better yeah. about style. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't work now. Like, straight guys have got their stuff together, you know. Not all <laughs> of them. No, of them. but some, some of them. Yeah. You know, and it was just very, I felt elitist a bit mm. to go in and think that we know best. So for us, we weren't going in to make somebody over. We were going in to use our our talents and our specialties as tools mm -hmm. to help affect change in here. I almost kind of tricking them, like, oh, we're coming yeah, to make yeah, you over, yeah. but we're right. actually, we're just using these as tools to help, um, to help you have some breakthroughs in here and in mm -hmm. here, because that's really what we're there for, is to help them change emotionally and mentally. Um, but yeah, the, the reaction after was amazing. Because I mean, what are people stopping you to say? I mean, obviously selfies. I've seen, I've seen I mean, it in action. My but. favorite stories I'm getting um, is the, the ministers mm. who will message me and come up to me in public and say that, you know, my whole life I was taught that being gay was a choice and that was wrong and you're going to hell and you're evil. And I have also taught that in my church to my congregation. And hearing you say on the Mama Tammy episode that you used to cry every Sunday and every single day begging God not to make you gay, yet you're still gay, mm -hmm. made me realize it wasn't a choice and that gay people don't have a choice and they are born that way and I'll never preach that hate in my church again. So powerful. knowing that our show has had, you know, been able to do just that to where, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's just one kid that doesn't have to grow up feeling the self-hate that as LGBT youth growing up when we did had to feel, right. you know, you're taught to hate yourself. You're taught to believe that you are wrong and that you are broken. Um, so if one more kid doesn't have to grow up like that, yeah, it's pretty powerful. It's worth it all. 
And I don't want to ask my stupid question that's next. <laughs> But I'm gonna. Cry up. I'm Oprah gonna try, us to cry up. I'm Thank you, try Oprah. To bring some levity, um, <laughs> the celebrity fans, like, I mean, who is who? Is, like, who are you friends with now? Um, one thing I don't love talking about because I'd be like, "Ooh, look at that!" Talk about there. it. I, you talk about it, please. But just you know, people that like, I mean, Chrissy Teigen, very public yes. about you know the being love, a fan, yeah. and I mean it's. Feeling is very mutual. Mm -hmm. We all love her. It was so much fun going on lip sync with her. Yeah. I almost said drag race, but that's not no. right. But it was, I it mean, could have been. pretty much. <laughs> yes. um, that latex outfit. Yes. I would have definitely won the runway. <laughs> um, yeah, so Chrissy and John, you know, it's funny, like growing up, I don't know how old you are, but growing up on Full House, you mm -hmm. know, like Kimmy Gibbler, and I'm friends with Andrea Barber now. And, you know, it's just so funny, like the people that on TV were like your best friends yeah. growing up. Like being They're friends in real it, life yes. and like realizing that there are so many amazing people out there on TV that really are just genuinely mm -hmm. beautiful people and mm -hmm. wonderful people. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Drag Race. That reminded me. We need to talk about Anthony getting his <laughs> drag makeover. What did you think of that? Uh, I thought he looked beautiful. I thought he looked like a 60s or 70s country music star. You know, I wanted him to have his guitar and I sing it with I wanted him to be with Dolly hair. or something, like a duet. Working nine to five. <laughs> oh, do we have to pay for that now? <laughs> I know. Okay. I don't, oh, we don't have We're the rights. news. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's totally like big old Dolly hair I and the guitar. I loved it. Yeah. But I love the conversation he had at the same time. Like, I thought it was really a good thing. I haven't got to hear a lot of the videos because it okay. just came out yesterday and I was traveling um, and I didn't have my earphones, so I didn't want to annoy everybody on the plane. Uh -huh. so I heard a little bit of it about him learning to be okay with mm -hmm. his feminine side mm -hmm. when he wasn't before. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's great. Can you can you share uh, a little bit about this Japan special that you guys have coming up? So we honestly thought it was going to be a disaster. <laughs> I, I mean, um, I would too because the language barrier. Language, the cultural barrier. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, Jonathan in Japan. Yeah. All of us in Japan. I know. Yeah. I mean, there would be moments he'd be like, I'm the loudest person in this country. And we're like, oh, you're the loudest person in every country. Yes. But, you know, just the, the differences in culture, you know, we'd run in and like be hugging our hero and like, hugging is not a thing there. There's a lot of bowing, there's a lot of smiling, but mm -hmm. not a lot of hugging. And so just the fact that there was a huge cultural barrier, barrier, cultural mm -hmm. barrier um, a huge language barrier, we thought it was going to be kind of a mess. And also, just like our crew, you know, it took a while for us and our crew to really learn each other. And, you know, we've done a lot of seasons with the same crew. And so to have a completely different crew with also different languages, we were like, oh, God, this is going to wow. be a mess. But it yeah. wasn't. I mean, our crew over there was phenomenal. They learned us so, so well. We had the most amazing translator who was really able to convey our emotions and our feelings every time she would translate for us. Um, yeah, so it was, I think the first episode of We're in Japan is, might be my favorite ever. Why? Tease it. Give us a little teaser. <laughs> <laughs> be very cryptic. <laughs> For those of you wondering why I'm looking off camera, it's because I'm looking at mom. <laughs> mom, mom, yes. Mom rule the world. Mom is like now? Yeah. And mom is giving me a no look, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyways. Because, I mean, if everyone listened to mom, <laughs> um, I think to me it's one of my favorite because it's emotionally one of the most powerful. Because, again, I really didn't think we were going to have emotional connections. Mm -hmm. I didn't think what we do would translate and translate so easily. Right. Um, Sorry, I'm just thinking about our hero. Mm. Uh, can I say your name? No. No. Okay. okay. Well, a lovely um, senior woman who just the most wonderful, warm, mm. beautiful woman that I found that even when I would speak in English, and it'll, it's cute because we'll speak in English and they respond to us in Japanese, but you never hear our translator. Uh -huh. And so it just sounds like we understand each other. Because <laughs> otherwise the show yes. would be half as long. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would speak and as um, Lena, our translator, would translate, her and I would just sit there and stare at each other's eyes. That's and you really don't often yeah. have that connection with people. Mm -hmm. You talk, they talk. You don't mm -hmm. just sit there and just lock eyes and just have these emotional moments without saying a word. And her and I would stand there and we'd just, and we'd just start bawling. Neither of us would be saying each other. But wow. you just see so much just 
love and gratitude in her eyes just for us being there and showing her love that it was, it was very powerful for me to realize that self-love and acceptance and uh, showing people that attention, it's, it transcends languages, it transcends culture, everything. Right. You know, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, that connection is mm -hmm. powerful. Are there any um, wish list spots that you would like to travel to next to take um, this show? I would love to go to Brazil. Mm. Um, we have a huge fan base in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Brazilians are amazing. There's, it's so funny because you're like Japan, very conservative, and then yeah, Brazil, yeah. like, whoa, yeah. so emotional, so loving. Yeah. You know, not that the Japanese are not right. loving, they're it's very loving different. people. It's just yeah. a quieter one, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, where the Brazilians are like us, they're very loud and hugging and kissing. So I think it would be very fun to go to Brazil. I also think it would be great to go there, just um, stand in solidarity with mm -hmm. the LGBT community um, since they now have a a lovely, you know, yeah. rather homophobic, mm -hmm. I mean blatantly, openly yeah. homophobic president. Um, so yeah, I think Brazil would be great. Um, I know Tan really wants to go back to the UK to do a few episodes. Oh, that would um, be fun. So I think that would be wonderful. You know, I'd say go back to my home state, but we already did Missouri, so. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Brazil, UK, yeah. It's cool. Just a few. <laughs> well, we're excited to see those Japan episodes, but before we end things, um, we're going to give you a lightning round, sure. if you don't mind. Absolutely, let's do it. You can give your answers to camera three. Okay. What is the last show you binge watched? The last show I binge watched? Ooh. OA. Okay. What classic TV show would you have loved to be on? I'm just gonna say the Cosby Show. I mean, I know it's not the most popular thing to say right now because yeah. I, oh, I wanted to be a Huxtable so bad growing up. Just the the love and the support they showed each other as a family. Mm -hmm. You didn't see that often, right? You know, just how they always had each other's back. Uh, the emphasis they put on acceptance of everyone and everything. It was such a good show. Yeah, I wanted to be a Huxtable. I, I wanted to be Claire's baby. <laughs> okay, what's the worst job you've ever had? Oh, hmm. Where do we start? I mean, I've been fired from every job I've ever had. <laughs> um, it was either it would either have to be Get and Go. What's Get and Go? It was a gas station. Go. They have okay. since changed their name though to Come and Go. K U M. Um, oh no! Not sure which was better. Not sure who in their marketing department That's thought that was a good idea. Bad. Okay. Um, so yeah, Get and Go, and also uh, I worked at Bed Bath Beyond, and that was. Oh my god. I worked at the one in New York on 16th Street, which at the oh time was god. the only one in New York. I hated so, that one. <sighs> Mm -hmm. Imagine working there, and I ran front end, so customer service, so all the returns constantly, all the angry people, yeah. What? I used to cry on the way to work. Really? Yeah. Not to say working at another Bed Bath & Beyond yeah. would, would be bad, be, yeah. but that one was just a monster. That store did more business in a day than districts did, you know, so it was, it was an intense store. What's the worst, like, customer interaction you had there? Oh, we've had people like jump over the counters and try to attack you. Because um, they'd bring back, you know, they had a very open return policy, but I'm like, if you, <laughs> I'm not even, but if you bring back like something soiled, clearly I'm used. sorry. No. Uh -huh. And they weren't okay with that. Yeah, okay. so there were some gross ones. <laughs> How do you feel, bef before I end things, because mm -hmm. this speaks to me, how do you feel about incorporating low, I don't want to say low end, but like... Accessible? Accessible stuff like from Target. On the or, show? No, no, like in, in, our, in your own God, life. the show is filled with Target filled stuff. With tar oh, God, okay. My house is filled with Target stuff. Okay. I love it. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, Target has always been way up here when it comes to design. You know, where other big box retailers, that was not a focus of theirs. And it's not just like home stuff. Like their commercials, the way their stores look, they feel that you should, design should be on the forefront instead mm -hmm. of afterthought. Okay. So no, they have great stuff. So you stuff. don't turn your nose up. No, okay. Target, Ikea, know. all of them. I think they're great. There's no, I don't feel the need to fill my home with tons of expensive things just mm -hmm. because they're expensive. It's they're good stuff. Go for it. What's the thing people should invest in, like spend the money on? Your bed. bed. Your bed and your bedding. You know, you spend 30% of your life in your bed. Mm -hmm. Also think of your bed as like your phone charger. You go home at night, you plug your phone in. Because you know if it doesn't get a full charge, it's not gonna make it through the day. Yeah, Same with you. If you don't get a full if charge, you don't get a full charge you're not gonna make it through the day. 
You're going to have to carry around a mofi, which is a big old cup of coffee, and plug yourself in. So to me, you should go to bed at night. And you know when you go to a nice hotel, and you, you put yes. your feet on the sheets, and you're like, you should feel that every night. And in the morning, move your feet in the sheets. <laughs> That's how you should start is, out Is this day. how you start your day? <sighs> I love it. Great. So yeah, Good to me, you. if you can't splurge on your whole house, if you need to do it one piece at a time, which most people do, mm -hmm. your bedding in your bed is, and, and you mean, when we're young, we don't think about it, but your bedding, like, it affects your backs and your hips, and you know, we're getting up there. Do we need have, to worry about that. Do you have, like, the junk drawer or junk closet, or, like, what's your, what's your bad <laughs> habit at home? Um, I definitely have the junk drawer. Because to me, like, I grew up in the South and Midwest, uh -huh. you know, my mom, like, when things would come over, you didn't have stuff out, you know, you yeah, put them yeah. in the junk drawer, yeah. where my husband's Vietnamese, and in his culture, you live in your house, we're like, why would you hide all that stuff if it's out on the counter? And so, to him, it frustrates him, because I'm like, people uh -huh. are coming over, I'm hiding everything in closets, he's like, why are you doing that? I'm like, because I don't want them to see the mess. He's like, but it's stuff we use. I'm like, right. and we can take it out oh, of the drawer when later. they leave. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely, you know, nobody can have their house perfect all the yeah. time. It's just impossible. It is. Well, you know, I'm glad to you're know the that Bobby, of England yeah. and you have a whole staff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank it was you. a pleasure. For all you, thanks for tuning in. If you want to see more of our Emmy chats, head over to LATimes.com. Thank you.